times and there are some extreme hot spots around the world and uh, nothing stays you know, stationary. No, it doesn't. I wanted to start off with talking about um, the global currency right now because everyone's concerned about the dollar and we're seeing the dollar decline right now. What is your take on what's going on with the global currency, with what's happening with other countries and how they're looking at the dollar right now? Well, I, I got to say this. It's, it's a little snide, but when I see that the dollar index is going down, I, I, I kind of yawn. Uh, what's it going down relative to what's what's it measured against so if it's going down what's going up and the answer is the euro uh, and now I'm coming to realize that we're seeing a phenomenon take place where all the BRICS nations currencies are rising that's Brazil Russia India China and South Africa so it looks like we might have a, a long-term uh, correction involved where for the last three years or two years plus, the dollar has risen relative to almost all currencies. Now that is undergoing a correction, but what started it a couple months ago was the euro. Uh, the French had their vote. I mean, they stole the election for Emmanuel Macron. They stole it fair and square. I, I love that phrase in politics. Um, they can't do anything about it. Okay, so there was a relief rally in the euro, whereas it had been shorted considerably, uh, just like what happened several months before with the British exit vote. It was successful. The French is, was not. French vote was not. So the euro started rising <clears throat> and it gave some, oh, I don't know how you call it, tailwind, motivation, whatever, uh, for other currencies, the minor currencies, the intermediary currencies. And, and now we're, we're seeing the dollar index drop, whereas the euro started this. And now the rest of them are following this. Um, it's a correction. Okay, just take a, a strange one for an example. I have a couple friends who come from Dominica, Repu no, the Dominican Republic. They call it Dominica. And uh, every one of them has complained of the Dominican peso falling. And at first, you know, a couple of years ago, I said, yeah, you know, big deal. No, it, it was a big deal. It was a 40% decline. So it meant their food costs for poor people went up. Uh, it meant that some of the, the, the citizens were looking to leave the country to survive and find a job elsewhere, uh, whether it's in Florida or Costa Rica or Panama, who knows. Okay, the currency situation has been turned upside down by the United States. Uh, by that I mean... <clears throat> When you institute QE to buy bonds, you at the same time, not you, but the Fed, at the same time with the government's blessing in Washington, supports the dollar. I mean, gosh, you support a currency by supporting its bond, right? Okay, so putting on African, South American type monetary inflation to support the treasury bond helped support the dollar. And... The euro could do this to a minor extent, but the Dominican peso could not. The Brazilian real could not. A lot of countries could not support their currency, and they fell versus the dollar, which was supported by QE. That is one of my major points regarding QE. QE kills capital and wrecks foreign, foreign economies. It kills capital because... The hyperinflation, like we learned in textbooks until the Reich economics came into vogue, when you have hyperinflation, it, it disturbs the entire cost structure. It tends to raise the cost structure without the ability to raise the final product price, and you don't get wage increases. So what you do is you squeeze the entire economy, you force companies and business segments into liquidation and all their business capital starts to rot. OK, 
Okay, that's the effect of QE that's not talked about much in the Western press. It likes to call it financial stimulus. It is, and economic destruction. Stimulate the financial center and destroy the whole economy. That's a fair trade in their eyes. But the other effect is to support the dollar at the expense of other currencies. <clears throat> so right now we have the dollar dropping in the index, but you got to look at what the index is. It's 52% the euro, 11% the, the China, uh, Japanese yen. So it, it's a silly index. What, when I get met messages from clients who say, look, the dollar is falling, I say, well, the only time it really matters is when it falls versus the ultimate currency of gold. And we're really not seeing that yet because this gold market is suppressed uh, by historical means never seen by mankind. Uh, and, you know, it, it's really sad what's going on here, Dave. It, it's sad that we need to do these things to preserve the dollar, not its integrity, but its continuation. And, and the result is that the entire Eastern Hemisphere is rallying around China and Russia to make non-dollar platforms and to kick the dollar to the curb, to try to marginalize it, to slow down its monopoly. And eventually, this is a big forecast of mine, Dave, mm -hmm. eventually the U.S. is going to say, we will, we will acquiesce, we will permit a dual universe where the dollar has its its sphere and the RMB has its eastern regional sphere. So we're going to see the, a USD universe and an RMB universe coexist. <clears throat> this coexistence will, I think, gain a, a lot of support as an entity cited as an entity. I mean, the press is going to say that the, the dollar managers are going to permit more widespread RMB use. And, and it'll be okay for a while, and the RMB will grow in its trade payment percentage, and the RMB will grow in its bank reserve percentage. Those are the two per big percentages. And the United States will poo-poo it all, saying, well, it's just the RMB. It'll never go anywhere. But it will because it's going to adopt the gold trade note, the gold standard step by step. And, and uh, when they do that, start the countdown on the dollar going away as the global currency reserve. And that, that will bring about enormous problems for the United States when they lose the global, global currency reserve. That's such an important point that, that two, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I, I wrote a public article on what – the global currency reserve means. It's a concept not well known, Dave, and uh, it's a concept that's going to be, I'm afraid, converted into a hot poker shoved up the U.S. rectum. I mean, is this why the IMF, I mean, Christine Lagarde came out, and when I'm hearing you talk about the dollar and the RMB, and we're going to have this dual universe, is this why the IMF said, well, maybe, you know, in a couple of years, we might be moving our offices to China? Is that why they're looking at this? Because they realize that this is going to definitely happen? Well, the IMF is uh, just one of the many pieces. You could point to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, you can point to the CIPS, the uh, Chinese Interbank Payment System. I think it's also called the Cross-Border Interbank Payment System. That rivals the SWIFT bank-to-bank -bank transactions. You could point to the BRICS New Development Bank. You could point to the One Belt, One Road. Uh, it's hard to describe that in a single word. I call it a cornucopia of projects and expertise coming to the table and funding. Uh, the IMF is just one of many things like that, M one of many different platforms that either is non-dollar or is converting away from Washington power and influence. I like to point out that back in 2014, the United States 
began not to contribute to the IMF funding. And the other Western countries followed suit and also did not contribute to the IMF funding. And suddenly, uh, China stepped forward and said, we'll fund it, we'll fund it, and we'll control it. So the only funding party was China, and they started to make the IMF rules. And uh, they started to make Christopher Lagarde's life a little bit difficult. I'm sorry, did I say Christopher? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I'll, that's right, yeah. Well, it's a man's name, I understand that, yeah. Christopher Lagarde now takes orders from Beijing. So um, it's only natural that they might open up offices in Beijing because that's where all the orders come from. And IMF is going to be important because when you hear about things like the dollar losing its currency reserve status and an interim period where the dollar will have international usage, but Washington will not have control over it, like, say, with the FATCA rules that are so onerous, disliked, and costly for foreign countries. When you hear about all these things, you realize <clears throat> the international dollar is going to continue because, you know, Panama, Hong Kong, London, Zurich, they will have dollars in accounts, Singapore too. So there has to be some kind of regulatory body over the non, uh, non-domestic U.S. dollars, the internationally floating dollars. And I've heard from many different sources that the IMF might take control of the international dollar when the United States loses control of its global currency status. Okay, so IMF is moving from its European offices. I'm not sure exactly where they're located in Europe. Is it Frankfurt or is it, I don't think it's Switzerland. Uh, anyway, maybe Vienna, I don't know. I think it's Austria or, Swiss, or, or Germany. But the, uh, if the IMF goes to China, it only makes sense because China is going to be controlling through their IMF offices the international dollar when the United States loses the global currency reserve that 99% of Americans don't know what it is. When you say China is going to take control, is it going to be the yuan as the reserve currency? Is it going to be an SDR as a reserve currency? What exactly are you saying when the the dollar is no longer the reserve currency. I think we're going to have a vacuum, Dave. That's when the dual universe will become an interesting concept. And there'll be a lot of questions, well, what is reserve currency? And you're going to hear, well, the dollar cannot be overnight dismissed as a reserve currency, but the RMB is building up its volume. By that, I mean banks are shedding their treasury bonds and buying more Chinese government bonds for their banking system reserves. But they will also be buying more gold bullion for their banking reserves. So when the dollar loses its global reserve status, you're going to see three, three in the dual universe. It'll be the dollar, the RMB, and gold. So those will... Uh, how do you say, fill the void or attempt or make initial moves to fill the void, but there will be some confusion. And there should be confusion because there's been a lot of just blind, nitwit acceptance of the dollar as being the forever currency. I mean, I talk in, in Latin American circles about the global reserve currency, and they have no idea what I'm talking about. And I say, well, when, when it's lost, they, they say, what do you mean when it's lost? The, the dollar is a constant. And I said, no, it's not. So said, there are countries around the world dumping hundreds of billions of dollars of treasury bonds right now. And they say, well, I'm sorry. I don't see that in the news. That's right. They don't see it in the news. So when this slowly happens, you're, you're, this is not an overnight thing. You're saying this is going to be a dual universe. They're going to slowly do this. And as this slowly happens, uh, 
what happens to other countries that say, you know something, we don't want to hold the dollar, we'd rather hold the RMB instead. Now, what happens to all those dollars that are floating around in other countries? The same thing that's happened for the last year and a half with hundreds of billions of treasury bonds has been dumped. The Fed, the Department of Treasury, they work overtime to soak it all up. Why hasn't the, the Treasury bond 10-year yield zipped up to 3 and 4% when hundreds of billions of Treasury bonds are dumped by the bondholders? You've got yeah. net selling and you've got very mysterious elements, entities buying the Treasury bonds. It's called the interest rate swap derivative. There's very, very little Treasury bond buying. You even have insurance companies and pension firms in the United States looking to get rid of treasury bonds. They're not, they're not yielding anything. You've got the pension and the insurance sectors being ruined right now because for six or seven years they've not been paying any bond yield. Treasury bonds are their main holding. So you don't have m money buyers out there and you have this gigantic dumping of treasury bonds at the same time you have an increase in the supply of treasuries from the US government deficits that have to be monetized not monetized securitized and it they are being monetized like like a, a good african country would we're monetizing a trillion dollars of US government debt why doesn't the interest rate on the bond go up to 3 4 and 5 and 10% where are the buyers it's interest rate swap derivatives. It's fabricated, phony, computer-generated demand. What, what is the basis of that? Well, the feeder system is the free money at the 0%. That's why the 0% will never go away. I mean, they can talk about these quarter percent moves and, and big deal. What are we up to, uh, half a percent? I mean, come on. It's basically 0% feeder system on the interest rate swap derivative. And I guarantee you, if they go all the way up to 1% for the short-term rates, they'll have other little derivatives in there to nullify the 1% and make it zero for the feeder system for that precious interest rate swap derivative that fabricates the phony demand for treasury bonds that almost nobody wants to buy. But many, many countries are dumping at a time when the supply is rising from the rise, from the increased government deficits. Oh, I tell you, the situation for the U.S. Treasury bond, it is a gigantic black hole that is ready to explode. I, I hear haughty, arrogant types say to me, oh, Jim, you know, what you're describing, you know, break down the treasury, it'll never happen because they... The, the computer control uh, with all the derivative machinery is so powerful and so advanced and so so experienced in operating that it'll just continue. And I say, well, what if the pressures are like three to five times greater? What if foreign countries start to dump in the hundreds of billions? It won't matter, Jim. It really just won't matter. And I say, well, you know, I've been there before. It was called 2006 and the subprime bonds, and they, we were told they didn't matter either. No, it's going to break down. I don't know how and I don't know when, but the treasury bond machinery is going to break down. I, I wish I knew how it was going to happen, but you cannot have a vanishing act for buyers, while at the same time more and more pressure to fabricate demand. At the same time, legitimate holders of the, of the bond dumping them in big volume while at the same time the supply is rising. All of those are in the wrong direction. Every one of them should be pushing the treasury bonds and their yield to 5%. And it's not happening. So there's pressure building on the only device holding it together and that is the derivative machinery operated by J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, etc. And 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 it's it's really sitting on the Exchange Stabilization Fund out of the Department of Treasury. It gets no attention at all. I hope that answers the question.
Yeah, I, I mean, there's many. I mean, you, you mentioned that, you know, people say, oh, yeah, this can continue on forever. But the Fed is already saying that they're going to, you know, start unwinding their balance sheet of like four trillion. Now, if they start to unwind this, if they're actually going to do it or not, they're saying they're going to do it you know, later this year. How will this affect the bond market then? Are they going to still continue to buy the bonds up as they're unwinding? That's the big question, isn't it? I don't think they're going to be able to unwind. It's up to four and a half trillion. And and also the um, the Euro Central Bank has, I think, close to four trillion. Um, they're talking tough, Dave. They're talking like this is two or three decades ago when they could do such things. And the market could absorb it because the economy was more vibrant. It's not now. So they're looking to do the cardinal sin of central banking. Raise rates and sell into a declining market. Not just a a declining bond market, a declining economy market. This was one of the major factors for the Great Depression in the 1930 decade. That's right. We're about to do the same thing, or we have begun the same thing that caused the Great Depression. I reason that since the subprime bond problem hit, pardon me, uh, that we've been in a recession and we've never gotten out of it. I don't care about lying economic statistics. Gosh, it's so plain. One of the funniest, most absurd statistics out there is not the consumer price index or the GDP economic growth. No, the most absurd one is the labor market, the jobless rate. They're they're boasting with the economy. And this includes Yellen, the the Fed chair. They're saying, well, the the economy is getting stronger because the jobless rate is down to 5%, 5 5.5%. No, that's the percentage of people collecting unemployment insurance. That's very different from the jobless rate. So when someone runs out of jobless insurance benefits, they no longer call him unemployed. They call him part of the, you know, falling through the cracks or uh, discouraged workers who are no longer looking for work. No, if they're not collecting benefits, they, they're told, we are told that they're no longer looking for work and they're not jobless anymore. They're, you know, living with mom or they're living on a park bench in full contentment. Now, the unemployment rate is somewhere around 23%, just like it was during the Great Depression. Back then, they didn't falsify the economic statistics. Back then, they didn't even have jobless insurance statistics. So... Clinton did something with Rubin's help to alter not just the consumer price index. They did some really neat tricks with that. But they altered the unemployment rate to basically merge it with the state-level jobless benefit percentage. Now, one of my favorite little stories is what they did with the CPI. They introduced the different things like, you know, substitute if something goes up in price, bring in something else in the index that did not. And, you know, my joke was, well, to bring in the Alpo dog food because that's a, a nice stable measure. So, you know, remove the higher beef price, include the Alpo dog food price, and everything's the same. No growth in the CPI. But they did something else that was really mathematically clever. And this is not well known. Uh The arithmetic mean is something very simple. You have five items, you add them together, you divide by five. That's the arithmetic mean. But the geometric mean is not so well understood. You multiply those five things together and you take the fifth root of that product of five things. And, you know, a little investigation shows you that if you got one item that just jumps, like like up 12% in a three-month period, but the geometric mean will not really jump much as a result. So they used a, a mathematical average. It is an average. It's just a multiplicative average that does not respond much to one item going up. Hey, hats off to Robert Rubin. You're a smart guy. You're also a stinking criminal because he's the one who instituted the 0% lease rate for the Fort Knox gold. So Wall Street borrowed it, sold it into the market, 
And that's how they brought down the, the real high interest rates that Clinton inherited. Oh, boy, I tell you. The U.S. financial history books are going to be very, very interesting, and I hope to write a few chapters. The Hattrick letter is a warm-up. We see the uh, the weak economy. This is what you've been talking about, that the economy is basically completely manipulated. A lot of the statistical information, like you were saying, employment, the CPI, GDP numbers. Yeah, I mean, the stock market's completely manipulated. So we have all this manipulation going on where, of course, the corporate media is telling everyone that the economy is strong. Look how great it is. Look at the stock market. Everything's fantastic. But when we look at these, the, the real economic data, we see that everything is weak. Now, the Fed is doing everything in this weak economy. Do you see certain areas of the economy that might actually bring down the economy itself without the Fed like realizing what's happening? Well, I sure do. There, there are a few areas of, of extreme weakness for the U.S. economy, and that is the car sector, the, the pension sector, uh, and, and even even the housing, the homes, home sector. Um, and then there's a big one, the energy sector. But I would say that the two biggest in there are cars and energy. Uh, I made a forecast a few months ago. I said the oil price is not going to make it above 50. And, it, and it, it just will not stay over 50 if it gets over 50. Um, I don't have the exact oil price right now. I, I, I realize that it, it's, it has a concerted effort to get above 50 again. But I don't think it will work. And there's a really good reason why I don't think the oil price will stay over 50 and it's called Iran. The OPEC gang of idiots, all they do is they get together and argue and yell and they don't agree on much. Well, they do agree on things, but it doesn't stick in, in reality. They leave, but they all dishonor the, the agreements they make. Like uh, Nigeria said, we're not gonna honor the o OPEC output cuts. And uh, there are a couple of other countries that has announced the same thing. They're not going to honor the OPEC output cuts. But uh, Iran, my gosh, they had, they had 80 oil tankers floating around, waiting for the sanctions to end, waiting for permission on the international oil market to sell oil and to accept currency. You know, we, we try to strangle these countries with sanctions, but they, they get they have workarounds and and they end and and what's the result Iran's dumping on the market and they're not even subject to the OPEC agreement so at the same time you have the shale industry committing suicide in the United States they need a low oil price to survive but to survive they need to produce shale related oil and the increases that they see with the output from the shale fields depresses the oil price. It's called economic suicide. Wall Street realizes they're in a bind and the oil price has to be up to 60 and 70 in order for this sector to survive and in order for the Wall Street energy portfolio not to completely collapse. But Iran is making sure the oil price will stay down. So now you got the Saudis saying, we're going to cut our production. We're going to take the income losses when we already have deficits. And we realize Iran is dumping on the market and they're going to take not some of our share, but the income lost in, in Saudi will be compensated by inca income gained on a net basis in Iran. Oh, my gosh. The, the energy sector is going to have another phase of big write-offs, losses, busts, bankruptcies, failures, bond defaults, etc. That's one of the biggest factors hanging over the U.S. economy. Another one is the car sector. For the first time in a long time, I'm getting scattered emails. I've had about three of them now. And Dave, you mentioned this too. You know, you know of uh, car inventory through channel stuffing, yes. uh, filling up 
big parking lots. I, I don't know what was it an industrial lot or was it a mall? This I was can't in remember a when, uh, it was in a public school. Public school. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a personal experience with this. One of my old college roommates in 1992, I think it was. He had a Vermont Ford dealership, and he was a victim of channel stuffing by Ford Motors Company. I mean, they cite the agreement for the dealers that you must accept all that the dealer sends, all the inventory, all the vehicles, cars, truck, whatever. And my friend Rick was bankrupted because the economy went into the tank. Uh, I think this was the Kuwait, uh, Iraq Kuwait war. And demand vanished, supply got shoved down his throat. Three months later, he declared bankruptcy, and, and it was one of the worst things that he ever went through in his life, including his family, and he ended up moving to Boise, Idaho, uh, which his son really liked. I mean, he's like one of my college buddies, so I, you know, I stayed in touch. Um, so the car sector is doing exactly what the housing sector did in 03, 04, or 05. They're doing subprime lending. They're not doing income checks on the underwriting of the car loans. They're seeing a tremendous amount of cars being traded in with negative equity to buy a different car, like a new car, and the negative equity is shoved into the new car loan. So if a new car costs, you know, has a loan of say eighteen thousand dollars, they're going to add on the four thousand in negative equity. And it's even more to borrow, but they're trying to keep the rates down. And they're doing something else that's ridiculous. They're putting them on seven-year duration loans when the car really doesn't have seven years, typically for collateral purposes. Oh, my goodness. I remember when I was buying a car way back, way back, you know, after graduate school, times like that, they'd say, well, you want a four-year loan or a five? And I said, well, I'll make it a five. I'm probably going to pay it off early. And five means that the loan, the car payments per month are less. But they're doing seven-year now, and they're shoving down ec negative equity from the previous car. Oh, the, the, the number of cars with negative, negative equity is alarming. And it's kind of like the negative equity in homes and back in 2006 and seven when it all burst, but we were told that don't worry, they'll, that'll always be okay. No, this is not always going to be okay for the car sector. It's going to break. And they're trying to hide in these toxic uh, securitized car bonds within the bigger asset-backed mortgages, uh, you know, asset-backed securities, and it's just going to break. I think the turning point is going to be when the Wall Street banks just cut and run, and, and it becomes quite clear that the car sector, with all their securitized bonds, is, is going into the toilet. All the while... You know, the housing sector really never recovered. Uh, you still have ridiculous underwriting of car uh, of uh, home loans. You just don't have the volume like you did before. You don't have the MERS database, the electronic database of titles, where they could use one house in three different bonds. That, that was pretty handy for supporting the bond market. And all the while, the pensions are, are, are breaking. Uh, we're getting more news like in, in California and Illinois, Chicago, New Jersey. The, the individual stories are ramping up. And they're not sufficient to break the economy. What they are is a signal of distress for the economy. I think the energy sector and the car sector are, are what we will see causing the damage that creates the crisis coming up. Jim, I want to go back to the energy sector with Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And I mean, you talked about that briefly. Now, Saudi Arabia, they're making deals with Russia. Qatar is moving closer to Iran. Uh, China's getting involved. When you look at this, why do you think they're moving away from the U.S. and moving closer to Russia, China, and Iran? Two reasons. One is they see the petrodollar 
disintegrating. By that I mean the standard of selling oil university, universally for dollars, like treasury bills. They're seeing that standard fall away. They're seeing that standard disintegrate. And the second is they see the United States as being an incredibly broken nation, both economically and politically. They're seeing their partner pretty much politically and economically decay into a, a, a state of complete disrepair that where remedy is not possible in a couple of years. Uh, the Saudis are seeing the United States as stealing from their own accounts. The whole Swiss story of UBS and Credit Suisse, those were false stories. The United States government claimed jurisdiction over the Swiss banking system. Excuse me? Declared those two big banks, UBS, Credit Suisse, in violation, imposed fines, and took like a receivership control, trustee control. And the Swiss banking system said, hey, whatever you want to do is okay by us. Uh, we're just the powerful Swiss banking giant. Wow. What was that all about? I'll tell you what it was. To gain control of the big bullion banks in Switzerland, controlled by those two banks, to steal the Arab gold. That was back in 2014 and 15. Okay, the Arabs are not... Stupid. They're lazy and corrupt, but they're not stupid. They saw their gold was being stolen. And I think the Saudis were given a message a year ago that your $3 trillion of reserves is not going to be made available to you because it's the core for the exchange stabilization fund operated by the U.S. Department of Treasury. You know, do some math, people. The Saudis were the big producing giant for 30 years. Do you really think they have only $160 billion in treasury bonds? Are you really that bad in arithmetic? Can you multiply a couple hundred billion dollars or $150 billion in annual surpluses? Can you multiply that? By 30 years, can you do that kind of mathematics? Do you see that the Saudis had $3 trillion in reserves? Can you do that napkin math, people? In fact, they did something interesting on the Treasury International Capital Report, the TIC report. They now broke out Saudi Arabia. It's no longer lumped in with the OPEC oil-producing nations or whatever they call them, the OPEC group. Now they're trying to make it look like the Saudis all along had 150, 160 billion in treasury reserves. Well, more like 3,000 billion. If you can do the simple math of accumulating 30 years of giant surpluses. If they called it the, the petrodollar as the petro, recyc petro surplus recycling, then where was the recycling done and what was its volume? D didn't it have to be giant? Well, yeah, it was giant and it was from Saudi. And it's a whole lot more than $150 billion. Okay, so the Saudis are realizing that they're never going to get their $3,000 billion back in treasury bonds. They're realizing that they're, they're, much of their gold reserves in Switzerland were stolen. They're realizing that the United States is blaming them for 9-11, opening up lawsuits against them to steal Saudi assets stuck inside the U.S. borders under U.S. jurisdiction. So they're looking for some new friends. And this charade a couple months ago of Trump going to Riyadh, Saudi, and uh, proclaiming a giant arms sale Oh my gosh, look at the details. I wrote a public article on that back in June, calling that a farce. I said there are four or so possible explanations for what was going on, really. And turns out that 
it wasn't any new arms deal at all, just a repackaged Obama administration arms deal. But there was more to it than that. I think it was some of the, you know, the older weapons uh, that the United States wanted to get rid of. And they're just shoving it through the Saudi channel in order to resupply ISIS. This is a joke. Why don't, why don't, you, why don't you say we, we move to the whole Qatar issue, uh, okay. Dave, and, and try to focus on some of that. And that's not really directly pointing to the Saudis and their collapsed situation and their collapsed relationship with Washington. The whole Saudi picture, I'm sorry, the whole Qatar picture is fascinating right now. We see Qatar where the other Gulf nations, they were, you know, pressuring Qatar with um, this block. And basically, it really hasn't gone anywhere. First of all, Saudi Arabia, the other Gulf nations, they never invaded Qatar. Qatar said, listen, we're going to keep we're going to keep what we're doing. We're going to work with Iran. Uh, we're not going to do all these things on the list. And they started to whittle down the list to a couple of points, uh, mainly with terrorism. So what is happening here? What were the Gulf nations up to? What is Qatar up to? And why is the U.S. just sitting back, pretty much just watching the whole thing play out? I think what Qatar did was they abound abandoned the Saudi gas pipeline concept. And instead, they adopted the Iran gas pipeline concept. And that angered the hell out of the Saudis. Uh, this is an enormously complicated pipeline uh, geopolitical battle going on. But it, it, I'm trying to simplify this because it, it's really difficult to wrap your head around. The, the isolation and sanctions and, and finger pointing at Qatar went nowhere, made the Saudis look stupid. And whatever Saudi is involved in, the UAE is right behind them. United Arab Emirates, that's Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Saudi and UAE are main suppliers of ISIS. They're also the partners for the Yemen war. Both Saudi and UAE have greatly depleted oil reserves. They're looking to steal the oil reserves, oil and gas, in Yemen, which is basically an undeveloped, not under, just an undeveloped nation with its energy deposits. So they tried to isolate Qatar. They tried to finger point Qatar as being you know, a sponsor of terrorism, which is a, a total joke because the biggest sponsor of terrorism is the Saudis. Uh, there, there's there been Langley efforts to uh, reduce the Saudi participation in terrorism for the last couple of years. And when Mohammed bin Salman uh, basically took the crown prince role, he really pissed off the Langley people, and we've yet to see the vengeance for that. So the terrorist is calling Qatar a terrorist. It's like Al Capone pointing a finger at somebody, you know, six or seven decades ago and saying, you're a killer, you're a racketeer. The worst offender is the Saudis. But they, they, they couldn't really get any attack on Qatar because the U.S. has military bases there. U.S. also has CENTCOM there, Central Command Control Center. They manage all their Middle East and Afghanistan operations there. So they couldn't get anything going with Qatar. Qatar decided we're, we're going to develop this big gas field. Qatar calls it North Dome. Iran calls it South Pars. It's in the Persian Gulf, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> and Qatar and Iran are going to develop it. When they develop it, they're going to bring it to market through the Iran gas pipeline. The United States doesn't want Iran and Russia teaming up to make a gas pipeline and to use the biggest gas producer, the biggest LNG developer, in the Persian Gulf. They don't want them to join up with Qatar. But it's going to be the Russia, Qatar, Iran link Jim, is for this the, the Iran pipeline gas pipeline. Is this the pipeline that's going through Syria? Yes, that's the plan. 
but you know they could change it and instead go through Kurdistan, part of Iraq, and into Turkey instead. I mean, w the United States loves its scorched earth economic policy. We don't like what's going on in, in Ukraine with respect to Gazprom supplying Western Europe, so let's destroy the nation. We don't like what's going on in Syria as a, you know, a, a cross point for the Iran gas pipeline and the Syrians and the Iranians are in bed together politically, so let's destroy Syria. Let's come up with all the ridiculous stories about sectarian violence and, you know, ISIS guerrillas taking over and, you know, beheading people. I mean, just turn to the John McCain, Senator John McCain emails and you'll find out his orders to falsify videos. That's okay. He's, uh, he's a protected one, isn't he? Now he's got brain cancer and one can only hope it's a quick end. I suppose with filthy thinking and corrupt thinking, you it can promote brain cancer. I don't think it works that way, but it makes you wonder. <clears throat> Qatar is not going to roll over into the U.S. camp. They've got significant German technology connections with their LNG uh, technology and, and, and you know businesses. They've got Russian connection with Gazprom. Uh, they want to link up with the Gazprom pipelines. The whole world is realizing that Gazprom is going to be the, the low-cost, high-supply provider of energy. And the United States is saying to Europe, buy our more expensive gas that is in inadequate supply because you're our friend. It's not going over. Qatar is also a big investor in some of the multinational European corporations. They did pull money out of Deutsche Bank, that was interesting, but they still have significant multi-billion dollar holdings in other companies in Europe. Qatar is not gonna roll over. They're a friend of Europe, they're a partner of Germany, they're a partner of Russia, and they're a site of the US military, and I think Qatar might be the location where the dual universe becomes publicized. The United States is going to be in a position where they're going to be asked by the Saudis, turn over this government, wreck it, bring about a revolt and a regime change of the Qatari em emirs. And the United States is going to say, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to have peaceful coexistence with the Chinese RMB, and we cannot stop the Iran gas pipeline that's going to connect Qatar and Russia's Gazprom and hit the market probably through Turkish pipelines. Just look at what happened with Ukraine. We, we broke up the pipeline network there, and Russia turns around and says, we're going to build Turkish stream. And it was off for a while, but now it's on, and even Bulgaria is is in favor of its connection. Bulgaria is critical here. Little known fact about Bulgaria is they, under pressure from Washington, blocked the Turkish stream construction that, from Russia through Turkey into Western Europe. But Bulgaria contained the inventory of the pipes for the pipeline. And now they're going to release it for the actual construction. Everything the U.S. touches with foreign policy turns to failure. Everything. Everything. All their foreign policy initiatives have turned out to be the opposite in outcome of what we wanted. The opposite objective was fulfilled. In other words, negative progress on everything we try. Push against the wall, the wall crushes you in return. I mean, just look at the Iran sanctions, one of the biggest disasters in recent years. Look at look at Iraq, our, our nation building of Iraq. They're turning out to be quite the Iranian ally. Any hopes that we had, the United States, of Iraq blocking the, the Iran gas pipeline? Forget it. They're going to try to get a piece of it now. Uh,
the, so, the leader of Iraq is now making openly critical comments about the United States and its stupidity, corruption, and, and failure of policy. Qatar is interesting, I think, because it signifies two things. The death of the petrodollar and the start of the natural gas cartel to fill the void that OPEC created. OPEC's not getting anything done. There's no unity at all. So it's pretty much a dead entity. They can have all the output cut agreements they want. Nobody's going to follow them, except maybe Saudi. Saudi has no friends. They're, they're so without friends that they had a, a, a little war with their own partner, UAE. UAE is their partner for ISIS supply and training and, you know, uh, troop formation, troop recruiting. But UAE is also the partner of Saudi in the Yemen war. The division of labor goes like this. The, the UAE uh, supplies some soldiers, but they hire a lot of mercenaries. Most of them are Australian. And the Saudis don't really want to get involved with the ground level troop activity. So they supply the Air Force cover. They, they bomb, you know, they bomb the hospitals. I'm sorry, they, they bomb the field positions. Well, there was an incident at the Aden Airport a couple months ago where the Saudis and the UAE forces were at war. They wanted to control the airport. Well, why did Saudi want it? Well, Saudi, Saudi didn't have the ground support, but they wanted to have control of the airport because the Saudis' contribution to this Yemen war is from Air Force. Air Force attacks, the air cover, air hits. So they wanted an air base. And the UAE said, no, it's ours. We want it fair and square. It's ours. We control it. We want it. And they wanted it for, you know, munitions supply and whatever. <clears throat> the Saudis have no friends. And when they started attacking Qatar with words, uh, it was pretty clear that very few, very few countries even spoke favorably to support Saudi. And I hear that Egypt is their buddy. I, I don't really think so. I don't think Egypt is their friend at all. Egypt is really teaming up with Russia. They've got some uh, energy projects that are starting to come online. Egypt might become a, a net seller before long and look for them to join in on the natural gas cartel. This is gonna be very important. It, it's Russia, Qatar, Iran, and the natural gas cartel. Dave, I'll, I'll leave you with a question on this topic. What currency do you think they will use for the natural gas cartel? Most likely not the US dollar, either the yuan or the ruble. But add in the gold trade note, because I think that's where it's gonna come that's, that's where it's going to arrive. So to bring this full circle here, we started out with you discussing the dual currency. And now at the end of our conversation here, we're talking about the death of the petrodollar, where these countries, Iraq, is I mean, they're getting closer to Iran. They're getting closer to Russia. Same with Egypt, Qatar. And they're looking to build a pipeline because it looks like, you know, the Middle East is falling towards Russia and China and away from the US. So as the petrodollar dies, we talked in the past about a local currency here in the US. Do you still see that happening when the, the dollar starts to, I guess, wither away? Yeah, I think you're referring to the domestic only dollar that, that yeah. is destined to come. Well, to, to begin with, the natural gas cartel, they're gonna be they're gonna be using the currencies of the producer. Of natural gas and they're going to be using the currency of the main buyer of that natural gas so that leaves you with the Russian ruble and the Chinese RMB but they're also going to want through a concerted co coordinated effort to introduce gold into the trade payment system this is really important because when countries of the world have bought oil for the last 40 years. They've had a standard of doing it in the dollar. So therefore they put US treasuries in their banking system. Russia, <clears throat> Russia and China wanna interrupt this chain. So they're gonna be looking to see that RMB and ruble 
are used to buy the natural gas. So the countries in the Eurasian trade zone that are involved within the reach of this natural gas cartel are going to realize we don't need treasuries anymore. And the dumping just accelerates. The dumping is enormous. It's $400 billion worth of treasuries in the last 12 months. And each month that comes in, they drop off the last, they bring in the new, and the last 12 months is even greater than the previous last 12 months. It's a running last 12 months total. It's getting worse. And, and it's going to get a lot worse when countries realize they don't need the treasuries to buy oil and gas. And that's the essence of half of the equation for the global currency reserve. Trade payment on the one side, bank reserves on the other. If you don't need the dollar for trade payments, you don't need to store the dollars in your banking system. So countries are going to dump treasuries. I look for key intermediate players like South Korea. What are they going to do with their treasuries? I mean, they've got the, the giant conglomerates. They're called Koretsus in Japan. They're called Kaibal in Korea. But they got Samsung. They've got LG. And what's the third? A oh, Hyundai. They got three giant conglomerates. They're an export giant. Not giant. They're an export power. And they're stocking up reserves. What are they going to do with their treasuries? I think they're going to swap them out for Chinese government bonds and gold bullion. We're about to start a wave, Dave, pretty darn soon, where nations predominantly in the Eastern Hemisphere are going to dump their treasuries for gold because they're going to realize something on a practical side. There's not enough treasury, I'm sorry, there's not enough government bonds denominated in Chinese RMB. It points out one of the great paradoxes of, of the currency system and its foundation. The United States has no problem supplying treasuries in enormous volume because we've got so much debt. The Germans have a, the opposite problem. They don't have enough German government bonds to go around when people regard them as safe and secure and a great safe haven, so the demand ends up turning the German bond yields negative. The U.S. government doesn't have that problem. They have the luxury of enormous amounts of debt, enormous amounts of securitized bonds. So we can produce a toxic foundation for Dozens and dozens of country banking systems. Wow. How nice. Okay. The, the, the breakdown point for the global currency reserve status to be lost is trade payment, Dave. It's trade payment. And the big event coming is the Chinese will win an agreement to pay an RMB for Saudi oil. U.S has probably told the Saudis, if you do this, we're going to start to kill you guys. You do this, we're going to unleash our terrorist weapon inside your country. You know, always blame it on the Shiites, right? Right. The Chinese are using leverage. They've been buying less of the Saudi oil each year, forcing the Saudis to look for new customers while they have some deficits to deal with. And the Chinese are saying, well, we're just going to buy more Russian oil. Sorry, uh, we can pay an RMB for that. And the Saudis are going to eventually say, all right, you can use your RMB currency to buy Saudi oil. Okay, okay, we give in. Oh, my gosh. So the main partner, the main foundation partner element to the petrodollar Saudi Arabia is going to allow some of their oil sales in RMB. If that's not just one, but say a handful of coffin nails for the petrodollar, I don't know what is. Because two things are going to happen after that. Other Gulf oil producers are going to say, we'll do the same. 
Kuwait, Oman, Bahrain will say, we'll take RMB for your Chinese purchases. Iraq will do the same. Iran already does. The other side is going to say from Southeast Asia, well, if China can buy oil from the, the Persian Gulf, the Gulf region, in RMB, uh, we in Korea, we in, in Malaysia, we in Taiwan, we want to do the same because we don't want to hold these treasuries when the central bank is printing a trillion to monetize U.S. government debt. We don't want our banking reserves to be in a currency where their central bank is monetizing their debt like an African or South American country because that's not going to have a good outcome and we don't want to be a victim when it all breaks down. So Southeast Asia is going to want to buy oil from the Gulf region and oil and the other Gulf producers are going to want to sell it in RMB. That is going to fracture the global currency reserve system in the entire eastern hemisphere. I hate to call it Asia because it's so much bigger than just Asia. It's Eurasia. That Eurasia concept is creeping in toward Europe. And they're capturing Eastern European countries one by one. And, of course, that means they will not capture Poland until until the, everything kind of breaks down. Poland has not found itself on the right side of history for, what is it, 100 years or is it 1,000 years? I don't know. The Polish just can't seem to recognize the loser in the room. They team up with it. So the United States wants to make Poland a natural gas hub. Try to contain your laughter <laughs> when the United States will supply it with expensive gas and in inadequate supply. Congratulations, Poland. You just teamed up with the loser in the room. When all this happens, Dave, you're going to see the trade payment standard fall by the wayside, and that is the dollar in the form of the Treasury bill for payment in trade. And the primary market is oil. Whatever oil dictates in the rules for the game, the rest of the international market will follow. By that I mean if RMB is used more for oil payments, then the RMB will be used more for grain and cement payments and for coal, and for timber, and then it's the international contracts. And uh, Euroraj made a great example. He said, Jim, uh, imagine an, a billion-dollar annual information technology contract from India to an Arab nation. The contract is written in dollars. Well, that's going to change. The contract will be written more and more in what countries are paying for oil. So that's why the Chinese deal coming up, it's already in the works. They're arguing about it. The United States is in the back saying, we'll stick a knife in your neck if you do it, you Saudi royals. And the Saudis are saying, we have to. We got big deficits. We're losing market share and sales of oil. And, and that could bring about the US white flag that I call the dual universe, where they say, well, we'll let the RMB universe live because we don't think it's going to go anywhere. And that'll be their next error because it will go somewhere. When the trade payment system breaks, Dave, and the dollar is no longer the universal, uniformly applied standard, the United States is going to face an incredible nightmare that they cannot bring in import supply to the U.S. economy and expect the producers, you know, whether they're Asian, like China, or emerging market, they're not going to take the dollar. So we need a different dollar, one that can be discounted. <laughs> I love that word, discounted. <laughs> well, the other word is devalued into oblivion. 
But, you know, just 30% a year for a while or 30% every six months for a while, that's what the new dollar faces because of its fundamentals. I, I, here's a simple question for you, Dave. What percentage of Americans realize that we're running over a $500 billion annual trade deficit and that'll have an effect on any domestic only currency? What percentage of Americans understand that phenomenon? I'm going to say zero. <laughs> I'll be generous and say okay. half of 1%. The, the dynamics and fundamentals for the U.S., when you strip away the global currency reserve status, are a nightmare. And that's being gentle. They're, they're so wretched that it will instantly threaten the United States to become a third world nation. Okay, here's some very simple calculations. $420 billion is 10,000 tons of gold. We've got a trade deficit bigger every year. So whatever we back our new dollar with is vulnerable for forfeiture in the equivalent of more than 10,000 tons of gold a year. And you get some idiots in the crowd saying, oh, Jim, but you don't understand. The United States can back its, its new dollar with oil reserves. Oh, really? <clears throat> Pardon me. Let's take a quick look at the strategic petroleum reserve. I did. I gave them a generous value of $50 per barrel, and I came up with $7 billion in value. So let's multiply that by 80 to get 560 billion. So the annual trade deficit for the United States is 80 strategic petroleum reserves. 80. Not a solution, you bird brains who claim that it was going to be the salvation. Not at all. Oh, but we've got all the shale oil production. Oh, you mean that sector that's encountering bankruptcy? Oh, but we've got all the deep storage gold, to which I say, oh, you mean that includes the Grand Canyon? Can you see the Grand Canyon entering production for gold? No, the United States is stuck. They're going to be forced to come up with a domestic-only currency that can be discounted. And it will be discounted. I'm thinking out of the gate, okay, here's what the Chinese said three years ago. You need to come up with your own currency and devalue it by 50% out of the gate. And the United States says, we can't do that. We'll do a Ukraine war instead. We can't do that. We'll block Iran and have a Syrian war instead. We can't do that. We'll ramp up our derivative machinery for the interest rate swap derivatives. These are the things we do well. War and bond fraud with machinery. Okay, so the United States said to, to China, we can't do a 50%, but when we do finally launch the domestic only dollar, I call it the new Scheiss dollar. Scheiss is German for not just shit, but, you know, rubbish, trash, flotsam, mm -hmm. jetsam. It's all called Scheiss. Okay, the new Scheiss dollar, I think it's going to have a 30% devaluation out of the gate, followed by another 30% devaluation like four to six months later. And if you're looking at devaluation arithmetic, here's how it works very clean. If you devalue by 30%, you retain 70. If you do it again, you retain 70% times 70%, which is 49%. Just look at what you retain, not what you lose, because the, the loss ratios are a little you know, more difficult. Uh, if you lose half, then things double in price, okay? But if you retain half, just look at it as retaining half. So, you know, you, you lost half and it's, everything costs twice as much. But if you have a series of devaluations, look at what you retain and multiply them together. So we, if we do back-to-back 30% devaluations of the new dollar, we're going to have roughly that same 50% devaluation. What does that mean? It means everything you import is going to cost twice as much. It's not going to be that simple. And I love giving the car industry as an example because cars have hundreds of components. Look at Chrysler over the years. They've been a big importer of Mitsubishi Motors. 
I mean for motors, engines. So when the devaluation occurs, Dave, there's going to be a lot of hubbub about, well, buy American. Then the difficult question is going to be, what is American that has the American label? What is American? And the good example is going to be the car industry. And I wouldn't be surprised, but I think Ford has the lowest foreign components in their cars. Not sure about that. I mean, you get some very interesting little examples like glass suppliers are springing up in Michigan, in Ohio, that are Chinese owned, but they're on U.S. soil with U.S. workers and they're paid for in U.S. dollars that stay inside the country. So, okay, that's buy American, made in America, but, you know, Chinese landlord, if you will. And it will become quite clear which U.S. automakers have the foreign component. Ford and General Motors have big Mexican operations. So the good question is going to be when the dollar is devalued for the new dollar, the new Scheiss dollar, what happens with the Mexican conversion? because many of the vehicles with U.S. labels are made in Mexico. Oh, it's going to be weird. It's going to be very, very weird. It's I mean, going it's to be really interesting, uh, but deadly, Dave, because the new Scheiss dollar is the third world country currency. Jim, it sounds like they're actually setting up for this because if you listen to Trump and it's funny that you're saying this where he's saying you know let's buy American it looks like he's already priming the people for what is coming because what you're saying is the imports are going to be very very expensive we're gonna to have to produce here in the United States and we're gonna to have to buy our products within our borders and create the products within our borders well yeah but what is Trump doing to produce more in the United States. Nothing. I mean, he talked about his trillion dollar infrastructure program during the election campaign last year. What's happened to the free trade zones and that concept? What's happened to attracting foreign currency for that concept? What's happened to the entire planning structure for that concept? What's happened to the goal of, of 20 to 50,000 new businesses in the United States and that concept. For the first, it was nothing. The second, it was nothing. The third, it was nothing. The fourth, it was nothing. And the fifth, it was nothing. It's a big nothing. You can't sell that which you do not make. You can't sell to Europe gas supply that you do not make. You cannot buy American that which you do not make. And the United States has had a generation, 30 years of outsourcing its industry. Trump wanted to bring it home. The only thing he's permitted to do is more wars and more weapon sales, or at least the charade of more weapon sales. We need a national initiative to reindustrialize the United States, to make its manufacturing and industrial sector Double what it is now, like it was in the 70s. Trump's done nothing in that regard, and I don't think the Congress will permit him to do anything in that regard. That's how messy things are. We need to drop the corporate tax rate. We need to increase the free trade zone incentives. And they're typically a reduction of the first three years of property tax and income tax. No, we'd rather have a new war. We'd rather have new sanctions against Russia. We think this is good. We're dumb as hell. We haven't had good foreign policy or economic policy. Oh, since 9-11 came to power in 9-11. They actually came to power with Clinton. The fascists destroy their host. The fascists defraud their allies. The fascists rely on war. The fascists permit internal fraud. It all results in a systemic breakdown, Dave. And that's what we have. Jim, how do you think they're going to spin the devaluation of the dollar? I mean, they just can't come out and say, hey, listen, the dollar is going to be devalued by 30%. Just deal with it. Easy. The dollar is going to be devalued to attract foreign capital. The jobs will come next. 
So we'll, and we finally will be able to finance our debt with more foreign investors. But primarily, Dave, the answer to your question is more foreign investment from inducements and incentives, and we're going to cut our regulations in order to help that along, and it's going to result in a lot of new job growth. Of course, your manager is going to you know, speak a foreign language, but that's okay. And by the way, we're not going to tell you that the fringe benefits will be near zero, but there'll be a lot of new jobs from the devaluation of our new dollar, and we want everyone to celebrate our new dollar. It'll be wonderful. Let's have some new songs. Let's put balloons out. Let's release balloons for our third world currency. Our country has become a wrecking zone. The new dollar will permit higher import costs, will, re will reveal the components being foreign made of many products, in particular cars, it will result in supply shortages because some nations, get this, this is really interesting, Dave. Some nations that want to supply the United States, they'll say, we don't want your new dollar because we think it's going to be devalued again and again, and we don't want to be holding it. We don't think you've done enough devaluations to make it stable. So there will be inadequate supply when foreign producers say, we don't want your dollar and we don't even want your new dollar. Then comes the social disorder. Riots. Food centers, fuel centers like gasoline, diesel, and ATM machines. Violence in all three. Food prices. Oh, but the United States is a giant food producer. Oh, they used to be. Are you aware that it's over 50% imported now? I like telling a story that back 15, 20 years ago, I used to run through the supermarket, you know, in, in the winter months and look to see how many different vegetables had foreign stickers on them. Well, that's a funny looking little tomato. Oh, look at that from Chile. <laughs> That's a funny looking pear. Where's that from? Oh, South American country. Chile is big. <sighs> Foreign food supply is going to jump in price. If we are 50% domestic producer of food, like fruit and vegetables, then if the dollar drops a certain percent, then put in half that as a factor for raising the food prices. 30%, I'll be a little bit more specific. If we have a 30% devaluation, we retain 70. Okay, lose half that. We retain 85. Okay, 85. 1 over 0.85. What is that? I don't have it exactly in, in my head, but I'm thinking it, it's probably like a 20% a price increase for food. Okay, that's that's one of the better stories because... We produce half the food. For cars, I think there's going to be some real big, ugly surprises. Toyotas are going to jump in price. Hyundais are going to jump in price. But you're going to see the big three rise in price more than people expect because of foreign components. The America First concept, it sounds all good. It's great for producing a sign. It's great for making a nice slogan, but the reality is we need to make more. I remember seeing in Costa Rica a couple of years ago a billboard that, boy, that, that caused a second look. It was, let's make things, the sign said in Spanish, let's make things of high quality to assure the, to assure the exports. So Costa Rica was realizing at the government level they needed to export more for the hard currency. This is going to hit the United States. We need to export more. We need to increase the existing free trade zones in almost all 50 states. We need to give them incentives, like cutting their property tax and income tax for a period of time. So they can hire more, but they're going to hire with very, very small fringe benefits. There are lots and lots of examples, and I've cited a few in past hat trick letter reports. Lots of examples. But we need more of that. Trump's not doing it. 
Trump's not on that theme anymore. Trump had talked about attracting a trillion dollars of foreign foreign investment and even the clever idea of bringing back a trillion dollars in treasury bonds that are foreign held. What Trump is trying to do is relieve the trade deficit by completely wiping out the current account deficit, meaning that we, we are stuck with this 500 billion a year trade deficit. But if we bring in 500 trillion dollars of foreign funds, we can fix our current account deficit and relieve the whole pressure for devaluating a new currency, devaluing a, a, a new currency. I tend to say devaluate, but uh, that's not a verb, it's devalue. Um, I, I get some nice email once in a while, Dave, it tells me, Jim, you made a mistake here. Jim, you used the wrong term there. Okay, well, well, thanks. I don't say, well, screw you, it's my show. No, I, I say thanks, I, I learned something there. So the verb is devalue. Uh, the United States needs to remove the factors that force devaluing the new dollar currency. We cannot get around this. I, I get amused, Dave. Uh, seriously, it, I, I, I have quite a lot of laughter here in my work. Once in a while, I'll read a, an article from a, a different kind of journal, uh, you know, something coming out of the fringes of, of Europe or, you know, whatever. And, and they'll mention the pressures are strong now for the introduction of a new shice dollar. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> when I laugh, I have to cough. Uh, it's one of the effects of getting over this nasty flu where I can honestly say I'm 99 point something percent past my nasty flu. I've got a little residual effect of, uh, you know, minor raspy damage to my throat. But, uh, the term new shice dollar is getting around and it's kind of funny. I coined it and, uh, you know, some readers might not even know what shice means, but it means shit. It means garbage, the new do garbage dollar, the one that's going to be devalued uh, repeatedly. I hate giving Venezuela as an example, but that kind of pressure is coming to the United States. It's going to be on a larger volume scale. Uh, if we must have a U.S. only dollar. That does not mean that it, that it can't leave the country. It just means that it is the official currency of the country and that we have the right to print it and control it. And it's not going to be the current dollar because the current dollar has other functions for global contracts, for global sales, and for global banking reserves. I guarantee you the new shice dollar will not be used in global banking reserves. They're going to be standing back to watch to see how much devaluation it suffers. They're going to be sitting back to watch what does the United States do as official policy to relieve its trade deficit. In other words, to rebuild its industry in order to export more. Every month we have new trade deficit statistics, imports and, and exports. We need to export more. And when we do, we're going to realize, well, gosh, we don't need to import as much because we're making more here. You know, try to buy some household goods or clothing and try to buy American. Where have the North Carolina textile mills gone? Shut down. Try to buy housewares or clothing that's not made in China. Good luck. I sometimes go into, into stores here in Costa Rica. I don't buy stuff. I don't need I don't need things. Not much. I look to, to, to see where are these things sold? Where are they coming from? You buy a fan, it's made in China. I just bought a bunch of shirts. I, I came across the for some reason, the Walmart here just started to carry the polo shirt, you know, the informal short sleeve shirts, nice design. I love them. I, I bought seven. They're not made in the United States. You buy a tool. It might have a U.S. name on it, but it's not made in the United States. Oh, the United States thought that they could become a finance center, a finance driven economy. 
And Greenspan said, we're offloading the risks with derivatives. It's all good. It's all fail safe. And then the Lehman crisis struck and made Greenspan look like an idiot. But he still gets those speaker fees because they're idiots out there who don't understand economics. Now, the United States is in, I'm sorry, Dave, to say, but the United States is in an intractable situation that cannot be resolved. We need a, a four, six, or 10-year period to resolve things after reforms are put in place. And we haven't even begun with the reforms. Jim, how close are we to this happening? Well, I translate that into a question of how close are we for the Chinese to buy Saudi oil or Gulf oil in RMB terms? How close are we? Because that's the first step to losing the global currency reserve status on the trade payment side. I'd say we're within one to three months away of that event. The pressure's building in a big way. Okay, I focus on that because that starts the chain reaction. It's the biggest event facing the petrodollar in years and years. I don't like to say a generation, but in many years. Because when the Chinese do that, the other Gulf countries, the producers are going to want to sell in non-dollar terms, and the other Asian buyers are going to want to buy in non-dollar terms. And that starts the whole process that undermines their banking reserve system. So when you say, when is it going to start? I look to see the first event. The first event is the Chinese buying Saudi oil and RMB. I think it's going to happen this year. It could happen before Labor Day, September. It, it probably going to happen in a few months, two or three months, something like that. I don't know, but it's not stoppable. And the Saudi, just look at the Saudi finances. Okay, here, here's an event. This is a very, I think, a clever form of thinking. Look at the Aramco IPO. The background is the Saudis have been lying about their oil reserves. They've been lying about their spare capacity. They've been lying about everything while they're waging war to prove their own lie. The war in Yemen is to steal Yemen oil reserves, to replenish their own that they've depleted and lie about. Okay, the value that the Saudis put on Aramco is $2 trillion. They're trying to do a 10% sale in an IPO, and they're trying to gather in $200 billion. Now, this is one area where the Western analysts have a lot of expertise. They come in and say, well, we've been making estimates of company value based on oil flow, oil reserves, profit, overhead costs, R&D, capital expenditures, CapEx. We know what we're doing in this area. So the comparative analysis for Aramco, it was it was that it was worth four to five times less than two trillion. <laughs> they, they, they thought it was worth, you know, 400 or 500 billion at most. OK, so maybe the Saudis will enter the room and say, we'll overpay a little bit for a stake of Aramco. And since we're going to be part owners of the Saudi giant oil complex, we want you to accept R&B for oil sales. You see my thinking, Dave? Yeah, I do. That's leverage. And the Saudis might think we'll over to themselves. We'll overpay by 50 to 80 billion for this share cuz we don't care. We want that dollar petrodollar standard to be buried. This is a handful of coffin nails. We'll overpay because we know that oil sales in RMB will catch fire. We know that other Gulf producers will want to do the same and not lose market share. We know other Asian buyers will want to do the same because they hate 
holding treasuries during the QE hyper monetary inflation period. That's why I keep my eye on Aramco. And the sale is going nowhere. The controversy is building. The debate is growing. And it's funny to watch. Jim, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? It's on www.goldenjackass.com. You know, I just did uh, issue number 160 for July. I, My gosh, uh, time flies. It's been over 13 years. It's been a labor of love. It's been a bit exhausting at times, but it's not hard to refresh and recharge the jets. Um, on the... Th- on the website, there's a free public domain page. It's called Main, and uh, it includes a lot of interviews like this and public articles. And I've started to write a few more public articles lately, trying to make them shorter. I wrote one recently on the natural gas cartel and how it fills the OPEC void. I wrote another on the global currency re- reserve, what it means and what the implications will be toward losing it. I'm going to try to do shorter very pointed, important articles like that. But anyway, the the website has a free page of interviews and public articles, but it's also the home of the Hattrick Letter. And that comes in the form of two monthly reports. It's the Global Money War Report, the defense of the dollar, how it has really become a war to defend the standard, the global currency reserve. I call it the king dollar and its reign of terror. It's financial terror. The other report is the golden currency report, a lot more data on, on gold supply and demand, mining, but I include the oil and the petrodollar in there, and I also include the Eurasian trade zone developments and One Belt, One Road and all that. So there are two monthly reports, and there's a free page for lots of informative things for those who are, are looking to get some background or looking to bolster their already decent knowledge base. But I invite people to sign up for the hat trick letter. I, I love mentioning my two favorite compliments, Dave. One is I was a hat trick letter subscriber from 09 to 13. And uh, I went away looking, you know, just to look, see other comparative newsletters. And I wish I never left because I am back and I, it was a mistake to leave. The other compliment I get, I, I love them both, is that I was listening to your podcasts and looking at your public articles, and I figured, well, you know, I don't need to pay. But finally, out of curiosity, I signed up for the newsletter, and I wish I had two years ago. It's chock full of all kinds of interesting things and neat neat graphics and, and quotes from your colleagues and explanations of your forecasts, and I wish I, I wish I hadn't delayed. So I invite people to go to goldenjackass.com, bounce around, and sign up for the newsletter. Uh, this, this gold suppression, Dave, It's not going to last much longer, and when the dollar loses its global currency reserve, the whole game changes, and they won't be able to suppress gold anymore. Everything's going to change. I agree with you. Everything's going to change. And by the way, I'm going to put all the links at the bottom of this video, so all you'll have to do is click on the link, and you can go right over to uh, Jim's website. Jim, once again, thank you very much for being on the Spotlight. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, Dave, and uh, hope to talk to you again. Times, and there are some extreme hot spots around the world and uh, nothing stays you know, stationary. No, it doesn't. I wanted to start off w- with talking about um, the global currency right now because everyone's concerned about the dollar and we're seeing the dollar decline right now. What is your take on what's going on with the global currency, with what's happening with other countries and how they're looking at the dollar right now? Well, I, I gotta say this, it's, it's a little snide but when I see that the dollar index is going down, I, I, I kind of yawn. Uh, what's it going down relative to? What's, what's it measured against? So if it's going down, what's going up? And the answer is the euro. Uh, 
And now I'm coming to realize that we're seeing a phenomenon take place where all the BRICS nations' currencies are rising. That's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So it looks like we might have a, a long-term uh, correction involved where for the last three years or two years plus, the dollar has risen relative to almost all currencies. Now that is undergoing a correction, but what started it a couple months ago was the euro. Uh, the French had their vote. I mean, they stole the election for Emmanuel Macron. They stole it fair and square. I, I love that phrase in politics. Um, they can't do anything about it. Okay, so there was a relief rally in the euro, whereas it had been shorted considerably, uh, just like what happened several months before with the British exit vote that was successful. The French's was not. The French vote was not. So the euro started rising, <clears throat> and it gave some, oh, I don't know how you call it, tailwind, motivation, whatever, uh, for other currencies, the minor currencies, the intermediary currencies, and, and now we're, we're seeing the dollar index drop, whereas the euro started this, and now the rest of them are following this. Um, it's a correction. Okay, uh, just take a, a strange one for an example. I have a couple friends who come from Dominica, Repu no, the Dominican Republic. They call it Dominica. And uh, every one of them has complained of the Dominican peso falling. And at first, you know, a couple of years ago, I said, yeah, you know, big deal. No, it, it was a big deal. It was a 40% decline. So it meant their food costs for poor people went up. Uh, it, it meant that some of the, the, the citizens were looking to leave the country to survive and find a job elsewhere, uh, whether it's in Florida or Costa Rica or Panama, who knows? Okay, the currency situation has been turned upside down by the United States. Uh, by that I mean <clears throat> when you institute QE to buy bonds, you at the same time, not you, but the Fed, at the same time with the government's blessing in Washington, supports the dollar. I mean, gosh, you support a currency by supporting its bond, right? Okay, so putting on African, South American type monetary inflation to support the treasury bond helped support the dollar. And the euro could do this to a minor extent, but the Dominican peso could not. The Brazilian real could not. A lot of countries could not support their currency, and they fell versus the dollar, which was supported by QE. That is one of my major points regarding QE. QE kills capital and wrecks foreign, foreign economies. It kills capital because the hyperinflation, like we learned in textbooks until the Reich economics came into vogue, when you have hyperinflation, it, it disturbs the entire cost structure. It tends to raise the cost structure without the ability to raise the final product price and you don't get wage increases. So what you do is you squeeze the entire economy, you force companies and business segments into liquidation and all their business capital starts to rot. Okay, that's the effect of QE that's not talked about much in the Western press. It likes to call it financial stimulus. It is, and economic destruction. Stimulate the financial center and destroy the whole economy. That's a fair trade in their eyes. But the other effect is to support the dollar at the expense of other currencies. <clears throat> so right now we have the dollar dropping in the index, but you gotta look at what the index is. It's 52% the euro, 11% the, the China, uh, Japanese yen. So it, it's a silly index. 
When I get messages from clients who say, look, the dollar is falling, I say, well, the only time it really matters is when it falls versus the ultimate currency of gold. And we're really not seeing that yet because this gold market is suppressed uh, by historical means never seen by mankind. Uh, and, you know, it, it's really sad what's going on here, Dave. It, it's sad that we need to do these things to preserve the dollar, not its integrity, but its continuation. And, and the result is that the entire Eastern Hemisphere is rallying around China and Russia to make non-dollar platforms and to kick the dollar to the curb, to try to marginalize it, to slow down its monopoly, and eventually, this is a big forecast of mine, Dave, mm -hmm. eventually the U.S. is going to say, we will, we will acquiesce, we will permit a dual universe where the dollar has its its sphere and the RMB has its eastern regional sphere. So we're going to see the, a USD universe and an RMB universe coexist. <clears throat> this coexistence will, I think, gain a, a lot of support as an entity cited as an entity. As this slowly happens, what happens to other countries that say, you know something, we don't want to hold the dollar, we'd rather hold the RMB instead. Now, what happens to all those dollars that are floating around in other countries? The same thing that's happened for the last year and a half with hundreds of billions of treasury bonds has been dumped. The Fed, the Department of Treasury, they work overtime to soak it all up. Why hasn't the, the Treasury bond 10-year yield zipped up to 3 and 4% when hundreds of billions of Treasury bonds are dumped by the bondholders. You've got yeah. net selling, and you've got very mysterious elements, entities, buying the Treasury bonds. It's called the interest rate swap derivative. There is very, very little Treasury bond buying. You even have insurance companies and pension firms in the United States looking to get rid of treasury bonds. They're not, they're not yielding anything. You've got the pension and the insurance sectors being ruined right now because for six or seven years they've not been paying any bond yield. Treasury bonds are their main holding. So you don't have m money buyers out there, and you have this gigantic – dumping of treasury bonds at the same time you have an increase in the supply of treasuries from the US government deficits that have to be monetized not monetized securitized and it they are being monetized like like a, a good african country would we're monetizing a trillion dollars of US government debt why doesn't the interest rate on the bond go up to 3 4 and 5 and 10% where are the buyers it's interest rate swap derivatives. It's fabricated, phony, computer-generated demand. What, what is the basis of that? Well, the feeder system is the free money at the 0%. That's why the 0% will never go away. I mean, they can talk about these quarter percent moves and, and big deal. What are we up to, uh, half a percent? I mean, come on. It's basically 0% feeder system on the interest rate swap derivative. And I guarantee you, if they go all the way up to 1% for the short-term rates, they'll have other little derivatives in there to nullify the 1% and make it zero for the feeder system for that precious interest rate swap derivative that fabricates the phony demand for treasury bonds that almost nobody wants to buy. But many, many countries are dumping at a time when the supply is rising from the rise, from the increased government deficits. Oh, I tell you, the situation for the U.S. Treasury bond, it is a gigantic black hole that is ready to explode. I, I hear haughty, arrogant types say to me, oh, Jim, you know, what you're describing, you know, break down the treasury, it'll never happen because the the, the computer control 
uh, with all the derivative machinery is so powerful and so advanced and so so experienced in operating that it'll just continue. And I say, well, what if the pressures are like three to five times greater? What if foreign countries start to dump in the hundreds of billions? It won't matter, Jim. It really just won't matter. And I say, well, you know, I've been there before. It was called 2006 and the subprime bonds. And they, we were told they didn't matter either. You know, it's going to break down. I don't know how and I don't know when, but the treasury bond machinery is going to break down. I, I wish I knew how it was going to happen, but you cannot have a vanishing act for buyers while at the same time more and more pressure to fabricate demand. At the same time, legitimate holders of the, of the bond dumping them in big volume while at the same time the supply is rising. All of those are in the wrong direction. Every one of them should be pushing the treasury bonds and their yield to 5%. And it's not happening. So there's pressure building on the only device holding it together, and that is the derivative machinery operated by JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, etc. And 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 it's it's really sitting on the exchange stabilization fund out of the Department of Treasury. It gets no attention at all. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. I, I mean, there's many. I mean, you, you mentioned that, you know, people say, oh, yeah, this can continue on forever. But the Fed is already saying that they're going to, you know, start unwinding their balance sheet of like four trillion. Now, if they start to unwind this, if they're actually going to do it or not, they're saying they're going to do it you know, later this year, how will this affect the bond market then? Are they going to still continue to buy the bonds up as they're unwinding? That's the big question, isn't it? I don't think they're going to be able to unwind. It's up to four and a half trillion. And, and also the, um, the Euro Central Bank has, I think, close to four trillion. Um, they're talking tough, Dave. They're talking like this is two or three decades ago when they could do such things and the market could absorb it because the economy was more vibrant. It's not now. So they're looking to do the cardinal sin of central banking, raise rates and sell into a declining market. Not just a, a declining bond market, a declining economy market. Th th this was one of the major factors for the Great Depression in the 1930 decade. That's right. We're about to do the same thing, or we have begun the same thing that caused the Great Depression. I reason <clears throat> that since the subprime bond problem hit, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, that we've been in a recession and we've never gotten out of it. I don't care about lying economic statistics. Gosh, it's so plain. One of the funniest, most absurd statistics out there is not the consumer price index or the GDP economic growth. No, the most absurd one is the labor market, the, the jobless rate. They're, they're, they're boasting that the economy, and th this includes Yellen, the, the Fed chair. They're saying, what, well, the, the economy is getting stronger because the, the jobless rate is down to 5%, 5.5%. No, that's the percentage of people collecting unemployment insurance. That's very different from the jobless rate. So when someone runs out of jobless insurance benefits, they no longer call him unemployed. They call him part of the, you know, falling through the crack. Big parking lots. I, I don't know. Was it an industrial lot or was it a mall? This was I can't in a, uh, it was in a public school. Public school. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a personal experience with this. One of my old college roommates in 1992, I think it was, he had a Vermont Ford dealership and he was a victim of channel stuffing by Ford Motors Company. I mean, they cite the agreement for the dealers that you must accept all that the dealer sends, all the inventory, all the vehicles, cars, truck, whatever. And my friend Rick was bankrupted because the economy went into the tank. Uh, I think this was the Kuwait, uh, Iraq Kuwait war. And demand vanished, 
supply got shoved down his throat. Three months later, he declared bankruptcy. And, and it was one of the worst things that he ever went through in his life, including his family. And he ended up moving to Boise, Idaho, uh, which his son really liked. I mean, he's like one of my college buddies. So I, you know, I stayed in touch. Um, so the car sector is doing exactly what the housing sector did in 03, 04, 05. They're doing subprime lending. They're not doing income checks on the underwriting of the car loans. They're seeing a tremendous amount of cars being traded in with negative equity to buy a different car, like a new car, and the negative equity is shoved into the new car loan. So if a new car costs, you know, has a loan of, say, $18,000, they're going to add on the $4,000 of negative equity. And it's even more to borrow, but they're trying to keep the rates down. And they're doing something else that's ridiculous. They're putting them on seven-year duration loans when the car really doesn't have seven years, typically, for collateral purposes. Oh, my goodness. I remember when I was buying a car way back, way back, you know, after graduate school, times like that. They'd say, well, you want a four-year loan or a five? And I said, well, I'll make it a five. I'm probably going to pay it off early. And five means that the, loan, the car payments per month are less. But they're doing seven-year now, and they're shoving down ec negative equity from the previous car. Oh, the, the, the number of cars with negative, negative equity is alarming. And it's kind of like the negative equity in homes. And back in 2006 and seven, when it all burst, but we were told that, don't worry, they'll, that'll always be okay. No, this is not always going to be okay for the car sector. It's going to break. And they're trying to hide in these toxic uh, securitized car bonds within the bigger asset-backed mortgages, uh, you know, asset-backed securities. And it's just going to break. I think the turning point is going to be when the Wall Street banks just cut and run. And, and it becomes quite clear that the car sector, with all their securitized bonds, is, is going into the toilet. All the while... You know, the housing sector really never recovered. Uh, you still have ridiculous underwriting of car uh, of uh, home loans. You just don't have the volume like you did before. You don't have the MERS database, the electronic database of titles, where they could use one house in three different bonds. That, that was pretty handy for supporting the bond market. And all the while, the pensions are, are, are breaking. Uh, we're getting more news like in, in California and in Illinois, Chicago, New Jersey. The, the individual stories are ramping up. And they're not sufficient to break the economy. What they are is a signal of distress for the economy. I think the energy sector and the car sector are, are what we will see causing the damage that creates the crisis coming up. Jim, I want to go back to the energy sector with Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And I mean, you talked about that briefly. Now, Saudi Arabia, they're making deals with Russia. Qatar is moving closer to Iran. Uh, China's getting involved. When you look at this, why do you think they're moving away from the U.S. and moving closer to Russia, China, and Iran? Two reasons. One is they see the petrodollar disintegrating. By that I mean the standard of selling oil university, universally for dollars, like treasury bills. They're seeing that standard fall away. They're seeing that standard disintegrate. And the second is they see the United States as being an incredibly broken nation, both economically and politically. They're seeing their partner pretty much politically and economically decay into a, a, a state of complete disrepair that where remedy is not possible in a couple of years. Uh, 
the Saudis are seeing the United States as stealing from their own accounts. The whole Swiss story of UBS and Credit Suisse, those were false stories. The United States government claimed jurisdiction over the Swiss banking system. Excuse me? Declared those two big banks, UBS, Credit Suisse, in violation, imposed fines, and took like a receivership control, trustee control. And the Swiss banking system said, hey, whatever you want to do is okay by us. Uh, we're just the powerful Swiss banking giant. Wow. What was that all about? I'll tell you what it was. To gain control of the big bullion banks in Switzerland, controlled by those two banks, to steal the Arab gold. That was back in 2014 and 15. Okay, the Arabs are not stupid. They're lazy and corrupt, but they're not stupid. They saw their gold was being stolen. And I think the Saudis were given a message a year ago that your $3 trillion of reserves is not going to be made available to you because it's the core for the Exchange Stabilization Fund operated by the U.S. Department of Treasury. You know, do some math, people. The Saudis were the big producing giant for 30 years. Do you really think the tea? I mean, the press is going to say that the, the dollar managers are going to permit more widespread RMB use. And, and it'll be okay for a while, and the RMB will grow in its trade payment percentage, and the RMB will grow in its bank reserve percentage. Those are the two per big percentages. And the United States will poo-poo it all, saying, well, it's just the RMB. It'll never go anywhere. But it will because it's going to adopt the gold trade note, the gold standard step by step. And, and uh, when they do that, start the countdown on the dollar going away as the global currency reserve, and that, that will bring about enormous problems for the United States when they lose the global currency, global currency reserve. That's such an important point that, that two, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I, I wrote a public article on what the global currency reserve means. It's a concept not well known, Dave, and uh, it's a concept that's going to be, I'm afraid, converted into a hot poker shoved up the U.S. rectum. I mean, is this why the IMF, I mean, Christine Lagarde came out, and when I'm hearing you talk about the dollar and the RMB, and we're going to have this dual universe, is this why the IMF said, well, maybe, you know, in a couple of years, we might be moving our offices to China? Is that why they're looking at this? Because they realize that this is going to definitely happen? Well, the IMF is uh, just one of the many pieces you could point to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. You can point to the CIPS, the uh, Chinese Interbank Payment System. I think it's also called the Cross-Border Interbank Payment System. That rivals the SWIFT bank-to-bank -bank transactions. You could point to the BRICS New Development Bank. You could point to the One Belt, One Road uh, it's hard to describe that in a single word. I call it a cornucopia of projects and expertise coming to the table and funding. Um, the IMF is just one of many things like that, one of many different platforms that either is non-dollar or is converting away from Washington power and influence. I like to point out that Back in 2014, the United States began not to contribute to the IMF funding. And the other Western countries followed suit and also did not contribute to the IMF funding. And suddenly, uh, China stepped forward and said, we'll fund it, we'll fund it, and we'll control it. So the only funding party was China, and they started to make the IMF rules. And uh, they started to make Christopher Lagarde's life a little bit difficult. 
I'm sorry. Did I say Christopher? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll, that's right. Yeah. Well, it's a man's name. I understand that. Yeah. Christopher Lagarde now takes orders from Beijing. So um, it's only natural that they might open up offices in Beijing because that's where all the orders come from. And IMF is going to be important because when you hear about things like the dollar losing its currency reserve status and an interim period where the dollar will have international usage, but Washington will not have control over it, like, say, with the FATCA rules that are so onerous, disliked, and costly for foreign countries. When you hear about all these things, you realize <clears throat> the international dollar is going to continue because, you know, Panama, Hong Kong, London, Zurich, they will have dollars in accounts, Singapore too. So there has to be some kind of regulatory body over the non, uh, non-domestic U.S. dollars, the internationally floating dollars. And I've heard from many different sources that the IMF might take control of the international dollar when the United States loses control of its global currency status. Okay, so IMF is moving from its European offices. I'm not sure exactly where they're located in Europe. Is it Frankfurt or is it, I don't think it's Switzerland. Uh, anyway, maybe Vienna, I don't know. I think it's Austria or, Swiss, or, or Germany. But the, uh, if the IMF goes to China, it only makes sense because China is going to be controlling through their IMF offices the international dollar when the United States loses the global currency reserve that 99% of Americans don't know what it is. When you say China is going to take control, is it going to be the yuan as the reserve currency? Is it going to be an SDR as a reserve currency? What exactly are you saying when the the dollar is no longer the reserve currency. I think we're going to have a vacuum, Dave. That's when the dual universe will become an interesting concept. And there'll be a lot of questions. Well, what is reserve currency? And you're going to hear, well, the dollar cannot be overnight dismissed as a reserve currency, but the RMB is building up its volume. By that, I mean banks are shedding their treasury bonds and buying more Chinese government bonds for their banking system reserves. But they will also be buying more gold bullion for their banking reserves. So when the dollar loses its global reserve status, you're going to see three, three in the dual universe. It'll be the dollar, the RMB, and gold. So those will... Uh, how do you say, fill the void or attempt or make initial moves to fill the void, but there will be some confusion. And there should be confusion because there's been a lot of just blind, nitwit acceptance of the dollar as being the forever currency. I mean, I talk in, in Latin American circles about the global reserve currency, and they have no idea what I'm talking about. And I say, well, when, when it's lost, they, they say, what do you mean when it's lost? The, the dollar is a constant. And I said, no, it's not. So said, there are countries around the world dumping hundreds of billions of dollars of treasury bonds right now. And they say, well, I'm sorry. I don't see that in the news. That's right. They don't see it in the news. So when this slowly happens, you, you, this is not an overnight thing. You're saying this is going to be a dual universe. They're going to slowly do this. And XR. Uh, discouraged workers who are no longer looking for work. No, if they're not collecting benefits, they, they're told, we are told that they're no longer looking for work and they're not jobless anymore. They're, you know, living with mom or they're living on a park bench in full contentment. Now, the unemployment rate is somewhere around 23%, just like it was during the Great Depression. Back then, they didn't falsify the economic statistics. Back then, they didn't even have jobless insurance statistics. So Clinton did something with Rubin's help to alter not just the consumer price index. They did some really neat tricks with that, but they altered the unemployment rate 
to basically merge it with the state level jobless benefit percentage. Now, one of my favorite little stories is what they did with the CPI. They introduced the different things like, you know, substitute. If something goes up in price, bring in something else in the index that did not. And, you know, my joke was, well, to bring in the Alpo dog food because that's a, a nice stable measure. So, you know, remove the higher beef price, include the Alpo dog food price, and everything's the same. No growth in the CPI. But they did something else that was really mathematically clever. And this is not well known. Uh, the arithmetic mean is something very simple. You have five items, you add them together, you divide by five. That's the arithmetic mean. But the geometric mean is not so well understood. You multiply those five things together and you take the fifth root of the, that product of five things. And you know, a little investigation shows you that if you got one item that just jumps, like, like up 12% in a three month period, but the geometric mean will not really jump much as a result. So they used a, a mathematical average. It is an average. It's just a multiplicative average that does not respond much to one item going up. Hey, hats off to Robert Rubin. You're a smart guy. You're also a stinking criminal because he's the one who instituted the 0% lease rate for the Fort Knox gold. So Wall Street borrowed it, sold it into the market, and that's how they brought down the, the real high interest rates that Clinton inherited. Oh, boy, I tell you, the U.S. financial history books are going to be very, very interesting, and I hope to write a few chapters. The Hattrick letter is a warm-up. We see the, uh, the weak economy. This is what you've been talking about, that the economy is – basically completely manipulated a lot of the statistical information like you're saying employment the cpi gdp numbers yeah i mean the stock market's completely manipulated so we have all this manipulation going on where of course the corporate media is telling everyone that the economy is strong look how great it is look at the stock market everything's fantastic but when we look at these the, the real economic data we see that everything is weak now the fed is doing everything in this weak economy do you see certain areas of the economy that might actually bring down the economy itself without the fed like realizing what's happening well i sure do there there are a few areas of of extreme weakness for the u.s economy and that is the car sector the, the pension sector uh, and, and even even the housing, the homes, home sector. Um, and then there's a big one, the energy sector. But I would say that the two biggest in there are cars and energy. Uh, I made a forecast a few months ago. I said the oil price is not going to make it above 50. And, it, and it, it just will not stay over 50 if it gets over 50. Um, I don't have the exact oil price right now. I, I, I realize that it, it's, it has a concerted effort to get above 50 again, but I don't think it will work. And there's a really good reason why I don't think the oil price will stay over 50, and it's called Iran. The OPEC gang of idiots, all they do is they get together and argue and yell and they don't agree on much. Well, they do agree on things, but it doesn't stick in, in reality. They leave, but they all dishonor the, the agreements they make. Like uh, Nigeria said, we're not going to honor the OPEC output cuts. And uh, there are a couple of other countries that has announced the same thing. They're not going to honor the OPEC output cuts. But uh, Iran, my gosh, they had, they had 80 oil tankers floating around waiting for the sanctions to end, waiting for permission on the international oil market to sell oil and to accept currency. You know, we, we try to strangle these countries with sanctions, but they, they, get, they have workarounds and, and they end, and, and what's the result? Iran's dumping on the market, and they're not even subject to the OPEC agreement. So 
At the same time, you have the shale industry committing suicide in the United States. They need a low oil price to survive, but to survive, they need to produce shale-related oil. And the increases that they see with the output from the shale fields depresses the oil price. It's called economic suicide. Wall Street realizes they're in a bind, and the oil price has to be up to 60 and 70 in order for this sector to survive and in order for the Wall Street energy portfolio not to completely collapse. But Iran is making sure the oil price will stay down. So now you've got the Saudis saying, we're going to cut our production. We're going to take the income losses when we already have deficits. And we realize Iran is dumping on the market and they're going to take not some of our share, but the income lost in, in Saudi will be compensated by inca- income gained on a net basis in Iran. Oh, my gosh. The, the energy sector is going to have another phase of big write-offs, losses, busts, bankruptcies, failures, bond defaults, etc. That's one of the biggest factors hanging over the U.S. economy. Another one is the car sector. For the first time in a long time, I'm getting scattered emails. I've had about three of them now. And Dave, you mentioned this too. You know, you know of uh, car inventory through channel stuffing, yes. uh, filling up 